the goal for today's deep dive is to go through four essential tools that you need to build your productivity toolkit. What I mean by this is tools that if you omit any one of these, there will probably be a notable issue in your attempts to organize your life. But if you have all four of these, you probably don't have to think another minute about productivity. That's what I mean by essential. So I will go through those. Um, stick with me here because after I go through these four tools, I have a special guest who knows what he's talking about, who is going to join me and we're going to, uh, he's going to help me with the questions and we'll get into this a little bit deeper. All right, but let's roll four tools I think are essential for being organized. Number one, this is not exciting, but it is absolutely necessary. Your calendar. Now this seems obvious, but actually you'd be surprised how often when I'm talking to someone is having a hard time getting their arms around everything they have to do that I discover that they are not taking their calendar seriously. They, they use it sometimes. Not everything is on there. They don't check it every day. So it doesn't sound sexy, but it's absolutely fundamental to being organized is having a calendar that you trust. It needs to be digital especially if you're in knowledge work. You have too many things happening in your life to try to keep track of just on paper. Digital also allows you to attach information to your appointments. Here is the details about where this meeting is. Here's the notes I need to keep in mind before I go on and do this interview. You can set up notifications to remind you of appointments that are coming up. You can, as I do, uh, have a separate calendar that is just for reminders, so it's not for actual appointments that are scheduled, but for reminders for that day, don't forget this is due soon. Don't forget there's an event later at night. So you need to take your calendar seriously. There's no way to avoid that. Now, let me give you an advanced tip if you already use a calendar, a tool such as Calendly to control access to this calendar. Now, this is more important than you might imagine because there is a tension that occurs in most people's relationship with their calendar. There is a tension between their time and what is reasonable for their time and their social instincts. So what happens is often someone lets you know they want to meet with you. Hey, when can we get a call on the calendar? Your social instincts kick in. This is someone I know. I want to be personable and helpful to someone I know. And it becomes a game of when can I find a spot anywhere on my calendar that works for this person? And if I can find that spot, we win the game. And what happens is this doesn't scale well. And soon you find your days are fragmented with appointments here and there, uh, and there's never any room left for you to actually get other things done. This is where having an access tool like Calendly works because it allows you in advance to specify to the tool, these are the times on these days that I want to be open to meetings. And when it comes time then that the person you know or you care about or you work with says, hey, we should talk, we should get a call, whatever. When you point them towards this tool, you are saving yourself from having to transition into that social interaction mode. Uh, the tool is saving you from yourself. It is showing you times that you predetermined at a more sober moment are good times for meetings. The person on the other side just appreciates the clarity of, great, I can select something and be done with this. So that's my advanced tip there. Separate scheduling from your deepest social instincts. All right, tool number two out of the four, an obligation slash status list. Now, I'm purposefully being careful with my language here. Typically, you would say for this thing I'm describing, you would say, oh, yes, you're talking about a task list or a to-do list, but I don't want to use that terminology. I want to be more specific about this. So when I say an obligation status list, I'm capturing two things. One, what are the things that should be on this list? Well, I'm going to say obligations. Anything that you have committed to do, you want that written down somewhere where you don't have to keep it in your head. Now, why is this different than a task list? Not everything that is on your list of commitments is an actual task yet or something that's just waiting for you to execute. It could be, for example, that you are waiting to hear back from someone else about the next step of a project. And this is a project that's on your mind because you've committed to do this project, but there's no actual task that you're writing down here for you to do. You're putting a stake in the ground to use David Allen terminology so that you don't have to, you won't forget about this and you don't want to have to just keep track of it in your head. This is why I add on the other side of that slash status. So in this list, you have all the obligations you've committed to, and you have a clear indication of their status. Again, this is something I think task, miss, uh, task list often miss. The status could be do this as soon as possible. 
or the status could be back burner. We're not looking for time to do this right now, but we don't want to forget about it because there might be a better time in the future when we are going to do this. This status might be waiting to hear back from someone about this. So I think obligation slash status list captures better the goal of this tool, which is to make sure that all the things you would otherwise be trying to keep track of in your head have a place where they can be. And these things are more expansive than simply here's a task that I need to do. All right, let's get advanced here. I want to give an advanced tweak on each of these four tools I talk about. So for the obligation status list, I'm going to give you two ideas. One, separate these lists by roles. We talk about this often on the show, but instead of having just one master list for everything on your plate, have a separate one for the different roles in your life. And I don't just mean professional and non-professional, though that is an important distinction, but within, for example, your professional life, if you have multiple roles, separate lists for each. As I've talked about again, uh, again and again on this show, I separate out my role as a teacher uh, so the professor teaching part from the research role in my life, from the writing role in my life. Those are all professional obligations, but I separate the roles. You might do something similar with your personal related obligation status list. There could be family household stuff might be different than the softball league that you're very serious about and you're the commissioner of, and you keep that all separate. Why do we do that? Because cognitive context switching is expensive. You don't want to be encountering obligations from completely unrelated cognitive context at the same time. Your brain has a hard time trying to switch back and forth between those contexts. It's better to be immersed in a single context and work on that till you're ready to switch completely to another context. The other advanced tip I would give here is go digital. I like to use Trello because I can have columns be my statuses and the cards can take on them lots of other digital information. So if there's files related to this obligation, I can attach it to the card. If there's email correspondence that is relevant to this particular obligation, I can copy and paste it onto the back of the card. If there's a checklist of things related to this obligation, I can put it on the virtual card related to the obligation. So take advantage of that flexibility, use columns for statuses, and you could use distinct boards for roles. You can use advanced tools here to do your obligation status list correctly. All right, tool number three, multi-scale planning documents. Longtime listeners of this show know that I'm a big advocate of multi-scale planning. What is my plan for the quarter? What is my plan for the week? What is my plan for today? That is a sort of an optimal division of scales for trying to keep yourself moving towards the things you need to get done. Uh, without getting too far off track. So one of the essential four tools is to actually just have those documents. Here's my quarterly plan. Here's my weekly plan. Here's my plan for what I am doing today. I mean, again, I am repetitive about pushing multi-scale planning, but it's one of the most important things that most people don't do. So if we're going to talk about essential tools for feeling like you're in control of everything you have to do, something to keep track of your plan on those three scales is necessary. My advanced suggestion here is that when it comes to the daily plan, have a separate analog notebook or other type of capture device for that plan. I mean, obviously you could use my time block planner or you could use another notebook of your choice, but having an analog notebook for your daily plan is an advanced tip because what does this allow you to do? Execute and reference your daily plan without having to necessarily be on a computer. There's a lot of times during your day where you probably are on a computer anyways, it's convenient, but there might be other times when you're not, where your plan says, go for a walk to think through this idea, followed by go do this errand and then come back and, you know, work on reading this book. And you might not want to have anything to do with a glowing screen during that period. If your daily plan is analog, you have it with you. For your weekly and quarterly plan, who cares? You're looking at the weekly plan once a day. You're going to look at your computer once a day anyways. Your quarterly plan, you look at once a week. I don't care where that is, but your daily plan being analog is an advanced tip there. All right, our, our fourth and final tool here, a core systems document. This is psychology hacking at this point. Have a piece of paper somewhere where you write down, these are the actual systems I'm implementing. 
So we talked about having multi-scale planning documents, but somewhere you want to write down, I do multi-scale planning. You might have a really good obligation status list, but somewhere you want to write down, I keep an obligation status list that I look at each day when I make my daily plan and I look at it at the end of the day before I shut down. Somewhere have written down, these are the actual systems I follow to organize my life. The reason why this is important is because otherwise your mind interprets these as fluid. I experiment with this, I experiment with that. Well, why don't I set up some other sort of software here? Knowing instead, no, I this is my configuration right now. These are what I'm doing. Let me remind myself of what I'm doing. Just knowing that there is a root or core to the different organizational ideas or systems you have helps your mind commit to it. Now, my advanced tip here is to laminate it and put it where it is easily visible. You don't need a lamination machine. It's fine to buy a clear plastic sheeting. I used to do this. So it feels more protected than a sheet of paper and just have it where you'll see it. Now, this is not really about remembering because it takes what three days before you say, I know exactly what's on there. It's more about that psychological boost. Yes. These are my systems. This is what I've committed to. I have systems and it really does keep you on those systems. It also allows experimentation to be much more clear and deliberate because when you want to experiment with something different, you can go to that core system document. This is the experiment I'm running. I'm going to try using this new approach, this new tool. Maybe after a month, then I'll go back and check and see how it's doing. It adds structure to this part of our professional lives that we often make implicit that it's just a haphazard collection of things that we fall into the habit of doing and can fall right back out of the habit of doing just as easily. So of course, systems document, a little thing, but it helps add a internal structure to your whole setup to try to keep control over what you have going on. All right, two things I want to note about this. First of all, a common thread that unites all four of these tools is that they're relatively technology agnostic. Unlike a lot of YouTube productivity content, for example, or productivity, hardcore productivity podcast, I am not that interested in hyper tuning your custom software setup. I don't care about you having some hacked Microsoft connect that allows you to do hand gestures that will then be interpreted through chat GPT and then fed through a Zapier script to make sure that your notion database of tasks for next week is automatically color coded. That's a hobby. That's like being into knitting or fixing up your bicycle. And it's fine if you're into it, but it really is not necessary to be organized. So I don't care what technologies you use. Most of what I just described here, you could probably do with a stack of legal pads and a 10 cent pin that you stole from the bank. I mean, I don't really care how you implement this. It's the systems that matter, not the technology or the details of the technology. Of course, the one exception is if you don't have my time block planner, you'll go blind. But we all know that. So that's a thread that goes through this. I'm relatively technology agnostic. Uh, the second thing I want to argue here is that I do think this is in some sense a complete set. And what I mean by a complete set is that uh, if you neglect one of these four things, you will probably feel the, the effects of that. If you don't have a calendar in your life, there's a lot of stress that comes from that. There's a lot of lack of control or, or awareness of your time that comes with that. If you have no obligation status list, you're going to be trying to keep track of things in your head. It's very stressful. Go read David Allen. That whole book is a psychology book. People say it's a productivity book. Getting things done is a psychology book. It's about reducing the stress of having too many things to do. So if you're missing one of these four, you're going to see a problem. On the other hand, the reason why I say it's a complete set, the other reason is if you do these four things and never again think about the word productivity or organization, never again consume any content on this topic, you'll probably be fine. Like that's enough. And then you can move on with the stuff that really matters, you know, having a vision, executing, structuring out your life towards depth and away from shallows and distractions. It's not to say there's not other things you can do that could be helpful or interesting. And some people are more into this than others, but this, this is the essential. It'd be a new Portonian. I know Jesse and I always argue about the right turn. A new Portonian. Uh, you want those four things. You want those four things going on. All right. So let me bring in someone now. I want to bring in a, uh, a guest. To, to help us talk about these topics and then answer some questions about them. It's my friend and the author, David Epstein. Uh, David's the number one New York Times bestselling author of Range. David, let me see if I get the subtitle right from memory. Why uh, generalist. So far, so good. Why generalist. 
Um, are the downfall of America? Did I get that right? No, that's, that's not right. That was the working title. That's working title. To replace what, it before it came out. Why? Why generalist something something specialist? Triumph in a specialized world. Triumph. I was going to yeah. say Trump, but I was like, you probably didn't say Trump. Triumph in a specialized world. Triumph okay. In a specialized world. Um, yeah. Also, the author of the Sports Gene. Yep. One of my uh, favorite books. Both New York Times bestsellers. Um, friend of the show. He's been on the show before. Uh, past episode. Anyways, I was hanging out, so I said, "Why don't you?" Why don't you come on? Why don't you come on, Mike? All right. So, David, let me get your take on this because a, you are a productive person in the sense that you produce really good books. You produce your newsletter, which is fantastic. Once, once every six years, though, I should add. So slow productivity, my friend. <laughs> uh, give us your newsletter name. I really like your newsletter. Uh, range widely. Range widely. Yep. Yeah. And you have studied, especially in that newsletter and in your book range, a lot of people who have done a lot of interesting things. Yeah. These yeah. generalists that have done really interesting things. So you've seen productivity from the standpoint of results yeah people who do cool things yeah not from fiddling or whatever um so what's your reaction here what am i missing i don't i don't know that i'd say you're missing anything but i think to emphasize a few of your points i mean you mentioned having a, a document for your systems right so that you can do much more deliberate experimentation yeah and i think that is absolutely a theme with a lot of people that i researched is that they have one way or another, their experimentation is is very deliberate, right? So like right. when I was writing about generalists, like you can become someone who just pinballs around and is kind of trying things intuitively at all times. Sure. But I think the people who became productive through those experiments had some system where it was like, here's the thing I'm going to try. Yes. I'm going to come back and reflect on, did that meet my expectations or not? And where do I pivot next from that? So there's a whole literature about what's called self-regulatory learning that has to do with this, where, you know, you say... It, it basically, if I had to boil down this massive uh, body of literature, it comes down to reflection, like having a deliberate system for reflection. So like when I was trying to write my first book, I'd never written a piece of anything longer than like 7,000 words. And suddenly I have to yeah. do 90,000 or 100,000. And I actually talked to a researcher, this woman named Mariah Elfring Gemser, who does self-regulatory learning research. And she said, start your journal, say, you know, what do I need to learn next? Why do I need to learn it? Am I sure I need to learn it? Yeah. Who do I need to help me learn it? Yeah. Then you make a hypothesis about how you're going to learn about it, yeah. run an experiment, come back, reflect on what worked, what didn't, and then make your next experiment. And that that sort of system of yes. deliberate experimentation, I think, is like ubiquitous. Interesting. So that's what, if we're thinking about generalist, which your book talks about the advantage of that approach, what makes generalism, if I can invent a term, successful is it has to be coupled to structure. Yeah. Otherwise, it could just become an, a, I'm sure people use it as an excuse for like, let me just bounce to what's interesting to me. That's right. And if That's you don't right. have a structure to actually uh, capture the the feedback, That's what's right. working, what's not working. You know, in my old days when I would do student advice, used to have this phrase we would use, which was study like Darwin. Mm -hmm. And it particularly mm -hmm. just looking at studying, we would say like the number one thing you can do, forget any particular system, is after you try a way for studying for a test, uh, after you try uh, a particular method for writing a paper, uh, et cetera, um, go back and say, how did this work? Did this work well? Could something work better? And I guess I used the word Darwin because you could evolve. Totally. Yeah, you pick totally. up what's working. So so we're, we're applying this out of productivity systems in some sense, but it makes sense. Uh, don't just buy something because you want to have software. Yeah be really specific about what did this work? What could work better? Where is their, yeah, where's their inefficiency? And what aspect of it might have worked? I mean, th this was like a trend in research I saw, whether it was people looking at how their own skills fit with certain lines of work or a project to invent some new kind of technology. It was, he here's what I think. I'm going to find a way to test that. Maybe this aspect of it worked and that didn't. Yeah. And then how do I use that to, to do the next experiment, basically? So that, that kind of process of smart experiments and pivoting. Yes, yeah, so we could call it Darwinian productivity or something yeah, like this. Yeah. Like you know what your uh, put out your systems into that competitive landscape, and then let the things that work survive, and the things that don't don't. Yeah. Uh, so knowing what you're doing is very important. Absolutely, that's an interesting twist to it. What about you? Do you have sophisticated, complicated, connect-driven productivity I, systems? I mean, I do keep like a self-regulatory notebook. Like, so I have something I call my my book of small experiments also where like at least every other month I force myself to come up with some hypothesis about something I think I'm interested in that right. usually has to do with expanding my own skill or knowledge base yep. and can then come up with a way to test that. That can be as simple as 
interviewing somebody in a certain area or as complicated as like taking a class or so something. So even if it's not connected to a particular project you're working on. It's, you, it's, it's, it's almost always growing out of something I'm interested in where right. I'm saying I need to know more about this or I need some skill that I, that I don't have, right? Yeah. Like so for range, I felt the, the structural challenges of the writing were getting complicated enough where I ended up taking like fiction writing classes because I wanted to understand more different types of structural work. Yes. Um, so it was related, you know, it was related to what I was doing. Um, what, one other thing I do have, though, yes. that might be a little different. I have something I call a master thought list. So okay. it, obviously one of the themes of what you were talking about was like getting stuff out of your head, right? Because you don't want to be taking up brain space with trying to remember things. Yeah. And this master thought list that initially developed kind of organically for me in my first book and now I'm much more systematic about is basically when I'm in sort of the wide net phase of a project, I start bringing stuff into this like you know, you can use Rome or whatever, but again, I think it's technology agnostic. Like I yep. just use some simple text document um, and it can be a, a figure, a statistic, a quote, whatever. I put it on the list, keep track of where it's from. And as like things accumulate, I move yeah. them physically toward one another. And then I put a tag over them. That's like the name of, you know, whatever cognitive bias tag, like whatever right. the, the theme is. And I type in a bunch of words I think I would, would come to my mind if I were looking for this topic. Sure. And then I start- Type in a bunch of words as- Tags or descriptors. To, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I move sort of like topics near one another. And this, it becomes like sort of a wiki of my brain, right? Yeah. Like where I can find stuff that's associative. And so not only do I keep track of things, so I, because I used to have this, oh, I came across something interesting. Like where the hell is it? Yep. And I would spend a lot of time refinding stuff that I knew I had found before. Yep. So I can put in a lot less time to like keeping track of that on the front end. But also I find that I come across stuff constantly that I think is really interesting. I need to read this. And it sticks in my head unless I put it somewhere. Yeah. And I found this is a place where I can actually put stuff that I probably will never look at again. Yeah. But it's like out of my mind because your, it was it your was too mind lets it go. It was too interesting to get rid of. Yeah. But I filed it somewhere. Maybe I'll see it again sometime. Like I, maybe I put a few words next to it in yeah. case I want to find it again. But it's like not burdening. It's not leaving like a residue in my brain anymore because I've put it somewhere. I hear that. And I like the idea we're being technology agnostic. Yeah. In fact, I don't even want to jump to what particular software we, we hear there's yeah. tags or this or that but you could be doing this with you know yeah. index cards unless you they're one of folders. your sponsors I, I think people should use whoever sponsors you that uh, exactly. that's the tech that i think must yeah. be used by all people does grammarly have a because i'm looking at my sponsors <laughs> here do they have a knowledge management <laughs> system because if so does roan have a knowledge management <laughs> yeah. system other than that we're technology agnostic but all yeah. those things except for except for my sponsors yeah we, we agree with that yeah so you could do this with folders you could do this i, I think ryan holiday does this with index cards oh yeah literally oh my gosh i oh, yeah i visited his bookstore them? and yeah. i accidentally elbowed a stack of the cards the famous cards and they like spilled over and i'm like oh my god i just like this is why back. but they fortunately they kind of stayed in order well, i was gonna say because honest to god i think he delayed his <laughs> I, book, and I don't it. look i don't want to blame you for that but i'm just saying <laughs> it's possible <laughs> that that seems kind of near i mean i do this with with a uh, writing project scrivener mm -hmm. um, oh yeah you scrivener but yeah. even okay here's articles i may or may not write for the new yorker here's yeah. a book that's like two books in the future yeah uh, i will create the scrivener project in advance so i have a place where there's a research place where i can start creating folders and putting things because again my uh, same type of situation i'm thinking you know i have this book idea that i haven't even sold yet yeah I just came across an interview and man, that would be really useful for that book. Go to the Scrivener project, go to the research tab, find a relevant folder, uh, you know, throw it in there. This is not an advanced technology for doing this. I'm only mentioning a technology here because all of the Zettel yeah. casting heads out there are like, no, my God, you should be doing, you know, yeah. some customized, whatever. This is not a technology set up to do that, but it solves the problem. Yeah. Yeah. It goes to a place. I know where it is. I know at some point, years in the future even, I'm like, oh, what did I think about this topic? I thought about writing a book. It's a bunch of links and articles and yep. they're all in there. They're all in folders. And it's kind of crazy how many, like tons of writers I admire. If, if I get to know them, they have something like this, yes. something like this, right? Whether they call it like a spark list or like some idea receptacle, whatever it is, yeah. to move things that maybe they'll never look at again, or maybe it's associated with a project they're kind of thinking about it, sort of gestating, but like we all seem to have something like this. All right, so then here's, I'm gonna give a take. Okay, all right, then you tell, take. Me, tell me if we like this Make thing. it a hot take. Yeah, here's, here's my take on spark list. Okay. If you don't have one, start with the simplest possible implementation. And make your frustrations with the current implementation be what drive you to a new implementation. So don't work backwards from what is the the most fully featured advanced possible implementation because you're going to fall into the vortex of fiddling. Yeah. Like, yeah this, yeah. this, and if I just do this, it's going to be whatever. Start with paper. I don't care. 
Yeah. Start with the simplest possible thing. And then when you get to a scale of ideas and use, you're like, you know what? Here's my main problem is that like I have to print it or this or that. All right. So let me just switch from this to like almost doing this, but with PDFs and okay, now, you know, it'd be really nice if I could tag it. Well, let me just go from this to something that just lets me. So start as simple as possible and let per particular frustrations drive you to new tools because those tools specifically solve those problems. You're much more likely to have a, a workable system and much more likely, less likely to fall into the fiddling vortex. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think yeah. that goes to your Darwinian approach, right? Be yeah. like, what's working here? Let's keep that part. Yeah. And what's not working, we need to change that. All right. So we've added to the, uh, so so Dave's addition to the essential staying organized toolkits are, we're going to say the self-regulatory notebook, Yeah. which we can kind of integrate with the core systems idea, but like have a place where you keep track of this is what I am doing. Yeah. 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 And and learning. Yeah. And and by the way, sorry, I, this, this self-regulatory like everyone should be doing this in everything. Like it doesn't yeah. spending a little more time reflecting on the stuff they're doing. There's like, whether you're looking at athletes or like, I was just reading a paper about surgical teams that yeah. one team spends hundred percent of its time doing procedures. The other 80% of its time doing procedures, 20% doing this kind of reflection. Yeah. What went well, what didn't, what can we try next time? Yeah. And that the 80, 20 team, their complication rate goes down much faster. The hundred percent team by taking this time to say, what what worked? What's a smart experiment we can try to improve on the things that didn't work as well as they should? What about stuff in your personal life? Uh, exercise, eating, parenting. Oh, yeah. Like you're, you're saying everything. I, I, I think, I, I mean, and again, I think everything. Yes, because I yeah. think I think this, this, again, this body of literature on self-regulatory learning suggests that we don't get all of the learning signal out of the things we do purely just by doing it, living through them and, and intuiting, yeah. right? That reflection adds like a whole other layer to that. Right. So as a parent, uh, if you don't have coherently written down, like these are the, the, the things I'm working on right now, this is my working framework for how I deal with X, Y, and Z. If you don't have it written down, then A, you're not directing your energy, but B, you're not getting a feedback signal that allows you to figure out like, oh, this strategy for dealing with picky eating really does not work. That's right. I mean, it's like stealing, it's like stealing a mindset from the scientific method a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I don't want it to sound like it has to be a burdensome thing. Yeah. Uh, cause I actually think it can take less time because you'll actually learn from the things that you're trying. Yes. Um, yeah. And you'll get better. I like this. Okay. So the self-regulatory notebook is all the different things you're doing on a regular basis in your life that matter to you, that you're doing with some intention, have it written down. This is what I'm doing. And this is uh, personal life, professional life. Also, as you're talking about even just learning goals, Yeah, I'm trying to read these books. I'm trying to learn about this thing. Um, and then our second idea we're adding is the notion of a uh, spark list, some sort of, some sort of place where it's not tasks. Yeah. It's not obligations, but it's ideas yeah, that, yeah. that might be relevant to whatever aspects of your life you have ideas in. Yeah, if you're a writer, it's books, but you know, it, it, there's a lot of other areas. And I think it should feel fine to put stuff that you're planning not to come back to yeah. on that list, right? Yeah. Because it's super interesting. The headline grabbed you. You feel like you need to read it. Don't read it. Put it on that list. And probably you won't feel like you need to read it. But if you do, it's there. But you know it's there. And yeah. you know like you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I like that. Two good additions. All right, so we have a bunch of questions I want to get to from our listeners. Uh, before I do, I um, want to mention one of the sponsors that makes this show possible. That is our friends at Roan, R-H-O-N-E, N-E. I said that weirdly. R-H-O-N-E, -E, yeah. Roan. Yeah, I know. I don't know. I'm thinking about Sparklist. Um, I want to talk in particular about their commuter collection, the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man. Uh, they are here for every occasion. You can go from pants and dress shirts to fourth zips and polos. So whatever the occasion, there's something in the co commuter collection that can serve what you need. They're very comfortable four-way stretch fabric that is breathable and flexible. Uh, this is part of what I like about this collection is, look, I run hot. And if I'm going to be at an event all day, I'm giving talks, I'm running around, I'm doing panels. Maybe I'm in a, a publicity tour or something like this. Really lightweight, flexible, breathable dress shirt type things is incredibly important to me. Uh, it also has a uh, lack of hassle because of their wrinkle-free technology. Uh, as you wear it, the wrinkles disappear. So you can travel with this stuff. It's going to look great. It is going to breathe. Uh, they also have gold fusion anti-odor technology. So again, you're doing one of these tough days. You're uh, you're not going to smell. It's much better than my old technique. Before I came across the, the Roan commuter collection, I was wearing thick woolen monk robes. Not as comfortable. You know, I really, I, I didn't think that through properly. So I'm very happy to replace my monk robes. I thought you looked good in those, but. I think people might imagine I wear monk robes and just sort of like contemplate deep work. 
but they don't breathe. <laughs> and no anti-odor technology. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but very comfortable clothes. Also good for teaching. I do like these for teaching as well because you really work up you know, head of steam when you're in the class all day. So I, I, this is exactly the type of clothes you want. So the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash Cal and use the promo code Cal to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Cal and use the code Cal. It's time to find your corner office comfort. Also talk about our Longtime sponsor, that is our friends at Grammarly. When it comes to writing, Grammarly is there to support you from start to finish. For the last 10 years, Grammarly has been powered by AI technology that you can trust to help you uh, write across all of the places, all the devices and apps where you do your writing. This AI technology has taken some recent large leaps, which have improved and increased the capability of Grammarly in ways that I think is really useful to help you uh, get the most out of your writing. Let me give you some examples here. Let's say you're stuck with something you're trying to write. Uh, it's an email you're working on, for example. Grammarly can help you get started with ideas and outlines. You might say, for example, hey, can you give me 10 possible taglines for this thumbnail? And it will give you some ideas to work with. Um, it can help you paraphrase what you're writing. Let's say you want it to be uh, more concise. You can say to it, hey, can you shorten this? Can you make this clear? So it just speeds up the process of communication when you're doing communications. Um, it can even do summaries. So you can say, just tell Grammarly, point it at a unnecessarily long email and say, hey, can you summarize this? So Grammarly really has taken a leap forward. So, so in addition to just directly helping you improve what you wrote, it can now uh, help you with the conception of their writing, with the tone of your writing, with the, the concision of your writing. So it's a, it's a really interesting tool. So you'll be amazed at what you can do with Grammarly. So go to Grammarly.com slash podcast to download it for free today. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y.com slash podcast. All right, let's do some questions. Dave is going to help me here as long as we have them in studio. All right, so David, these uh, these questions all come from podcast listeners. Let's see what we got here. Oh, here we go. All right, our first question is from Ben. Ben says, what is one of the most underrated productivity superpowers people hear about, but don't actually uh, use enough or recognize its true effectiveness? Um, I asked Dave about this before the show, and he said cocaine. So, I mean, it not wrong. It helps you focus. It, it, it also makes you awesome. People hear a lot about it. Makes they you, don't implement. Makes you awesome. I mean, have you ever seen like a 1980s action film? Yeah. All produced or written by people. Like, okay. <laughs> you don't get commando. You wouldn't be saying that unless cocaine were one of your sponsors. Well, that's true. But that's for the second half of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by cocaine. <laughs> have more thoughts and be awesome. Cocaine. <laughs> Promo code Cal. Um, all right, productivity superpower. All right, I'm going to give two. You think, uh, so I guess the idea here is here's something that people don't do that but this, should. But it's something that they do hear about. Was I guess question, it has right? to be something so to hear about. So it should be obscure. So it could be obscure. And, and let's, well, yeah, maybe they should hear about it. And let's use productivity real generally. It's just like something okay. that helps you um, do the stuff you want to do, the important stuff better, or sure. it could mean be more, better organized. We'll use one of those definitions. Um, I'm going to say shutdown ritual. Right, good one. Good. That's contrary in it because a shutdown ritual doesn't, in the moment, help you organize or execute work, but it does help you clear the mechanism of your brain when your workday is done, so that it can actually rest and recharge, so that you're not burnt out, and so you can reattack your work the next day with freshness. But more importantly, also not have to have this insistent background uh, drip of stress in your time outside of work. So I'm going to, in a contrarian twist, I'm going to throw having a good shutdown routine as a very un, un uh, what do they call it underrated productivity strategy. All right, can you think of one? Yeah, um, I'm thinking of a couple. I'm trying to decide. I think I'm going to go with one that people I think have really heard of but don't actually do is saying no to things that you want to do. Like it's very easy. Everyone here is like you have to say no to more. It's almost like fetishized. Yeah, you have to say no to stuff. Yeah, but I think people primarily say no to stuff 
that they don't really want to do anyway. Easy I think notes. you have to say no to some things that you do want to do. Yes. Uh, and take note of that. Oh, interesting. Um, you say no. You say no a lot, right? Yeah, I have a I have a Henry Miller, the author, like a handwritten postcard of his that I bought. Yeah, that is him rejecting uh, a writing assignment, and his excuse is, "I have a lot of stuff to do, and I'm gonna have to just go to Europe. I'm sorry, I can't do it." So it, it's sort of he's like not actually giving, because I'm always thinking like, "Do I have an excuse?" And I have to remind, you don't need one. Don't like, give one. You don't. You don't need. One. Yeah. And so. I'm better at it than I used to be. Yep. Uh, still aspiring to to be better. I like that. No to things that that you should say yes to because that does trap people, right? It's that there's the element of the thing that there's a cool element. Yeah. I yeah. mean, but for you and I who do speaking and stuff like this, that's usually going to be like a, either a location. Yeah. Or an audience that, in the abstract, is like, oh, that'd be really cool. Uh, I mean, there's so many interesting people out there. I would love to meet all of them. Yes. But like, and like cool places to go. Yeah. And the better you do at stuff, the more of those opportunities to meet incredibly interesting people and go cool places, yeah. you know, they happen, yeah. but then can prevent you from doing the things that gave you those opportunities in the first place. Yeah. This was a Ryan Holiday line. The, the better you get at writing, the more the universe conspires to stop you from writing. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's a good one. Uh, the other no, what's the, the other no technique is always, you have to imagine yourself doing the thing tomorrow. So how would you feel if this thing you're about to say yes to was going to happen mm -hmm, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And would you be psyched about it? You know, like, oh, that'd be fun. Like, yeah, I'm going to hang out with so-and-so or do whatever. Or you're like, oh my God, I got to fly to Dubai tomorrow. Like, it's going to be like such like a giant like schedule footprint. And I'm going oh, yeah, to about it. That's a good sort of technique. Yeah. Like imagine yourself having said like yes to it and it's right away. Yeah. And are you feel good? Yeah. Are yeah. you excited about it? Like, I'm glad it's yeah. right now or yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting one. Yeah. Um, now I'm thinking of others while we're, yeah. Okay. So what else do we got? I mean, you know, Teresa Mabil's like progress principle where sure. it's like you get something done, write it down because it builds momentum. Yeah. I, I kind of like that. Like, yeah. cause you do realize you're actually doing stuff and you start to feel good and like yeah. positive emotions lead you to get more stuff done. But I think it, I think of that and also planning fallacy, right? Like people think they can get way more stuff done than they actually can. Yep. So for me, when I write down things that are core things I need, I want to get done today. Yeah. I frankly just list half as many things as I used to some years ago. Yep. And that's way better because then I don't end the list. You know, otherwise you have a list, then you carry things over to the next day it gets until worse. the list gets so stupid that you just throw the whole thing out. Yeah. So I just take my intuition of how many things I'm going to get done that day and cut it in half. Cut in half. I've talked about that before. Well, okay. So then I will pile onto that. Okay. Pile on. Uh, and say, um, scheduling every minute of your work day, okay. which is like at the core of time blocking. And of course I talk about time blocking all the time, but I do think it is underrated, right? Because, uh, people don't do it mm -hmm. in large part because they think it's going to be restrictive. But one of the big advantages of it, like here's my plan for the day, is you see how it went. Yeah. And right. that's a very strong right. feedback signal, right? right. You this say, is going back to our like deliberate experimentation. Exactly. Issue. This is just like with your self-regulatory notebook. This yeah. is a, a scheduling experiment you run every day. And it doesn't take long for you to realize like, okay, this idea that uh, A, checking my email is going to take 10 minutes. Yeah. Folly, right? This idea B, that I was going to write this type of report I have to write once a week. I wanted it to take a half hour Yeah, because it would be great if it took a half hour. Right, right. It could fit into all these <laughs> right, other things. Thing. This I is feel a, that it should take a half hour, should. but it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, people fall in love with the schedule that they create where they say, wouldn't this be great? Yeah. Like all these things I'm getting done. Uh, then you get the feedback of this takes 90 minutes. Yeah. This trashes my mind. And so I can't jump from this straight into this. And no, I can't spend an hour on my inbox at the end of the day because I'm exhausted and there's too much context shifting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a feedback signal. I mean, and that's another big point too, right? Is when people do that, they don't budget in the transition time from like switching cognitive tasks, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to add that. Oh, we're going to pile on here. Who is this? Uh, ben. All right, Ben, we're piling on here <laughs> in our answer. Um, here's, it's not superpower. Now I'm going to talk about productivity sort of small tactics that have a uh, punch above their weight class okay. in terms of their positive small impact. Punch above right. the weight class. Okay. All right. So not cocaine because that's a big tactic. Cocaine at, above all weight classes. Promo code Cal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cocaine. Yeah. Brought to you by our sponsor. Brought to you by our sponsor, okay. Cocaine. Yeah, that, that, that uh, just lives up to its well-deserved reputation as being important. All right. Here's something as small that I think punches above its weight class is the meeting buffer. It's just a rule. If I schedule a meeting on my calendar, I add a 15 minute meeting immediately after it, when I schedule it. And it's just a context shift, um, take care of all the stuff that came up mm -hmm, in the meeting, mm -hmm, get that mm -hmm. written down, clear it out of your head, like read some baseball trade rumors for 10 minutes. Just mm -hmm. like, let that all clear before you go on to the next thing. Yeah. And if you just schedule that immediately, okay, how long we're doing an hour for the zoom call? Great. I'm going to hour, 15 minutes on my calendar. Yeah. And then yep. that's just protected. So like nothing totally. else can. Uh, you're not taking up that much of your time. It makes a, just the, the cognitive experience of the day 
becomes uh, significantly less frenetic and significantly less exhausting because you're not um, trying to shift from one cognitive context full of open loops. Yeah. Oh my God, like I'm supposed to do this and that and this gave me all these ideas and I'm jumping from this immediately onto another call. All of that is open in my head as I'm trying to deal with this new thing. That's exhausting. Totally. I mean, I call this like used buffer. I call this transition time, right? Yep. And I think this this is making me think of we're both a fan of Gloria Mark and her work, sure. right? And she talked about the big and little mind. I think she might have taken that language from Maya Angelou, who talked about like when she was really engaged in writing, then she'd have to sort of break and do something kind of mindless, like yep. little puzzles or whatever it was. And so, yeah, I think that's a big one. Yeah. And Maya Angelou also, uh, Sherry was an important part of her writing process, which I think is cool. She would bring Sherry not, to the hotel cocaine, room. Okay. I mean, it's not as cool as cocaine. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I, and I think they would, like at the end of the writing, she would have a little bit of Sherry and she would go to hotel rooms and take the pictures off the wall. So there were like no distractions except for the ones that she had planned herself. Exactly. Right? And she wrote on the bed, uh, propped up on one arm and she had calluses because like, that's just how she wrote propped mm -hmm. up. And it had to be like, a the, she had to have the stuff off the wall. So there was no like cognitive cues and she got used to it and she would write on legal pads on the bed and then have some Sherry and they like go home, uh, that's the schedule. I wonder how much like Darwinian productivity went into that because I doubt she one day was like, I'm going to a hotel, taking uh, the pictures off the wall, laying yeah. on one arm and having some sherry and some crossword puzzles. I bet she was traveling at some point for something and it was in some like terrible hotel or motel somewhere. And she had an incredibly productive ride. And was experience. like, this works. This is it. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. I like that plan. You should drink more sherry. All right. Another question. This one comes from Gabe. Uh, what are the benefits of journaling? And how would you suggest go about trying to do so? I mean, this really goes back to both of the things you added, I suppose. You have self-regulatory journaling, yeah. which is about tracking things you're doing and how it went. It's about journal as a feedback mechanism. Then there's this sort of spark book type yeah, journaling, yeah. which is about capture, uh, getting ideas out of your head so that you don't have to hold on to them. Both of them have a cognitive advantage. Um, so what other type of journaling are there? So where would we put, people normally think about self-reflection, not in the terms of a more experimental sense, but just where am like I? Getting your emotions out. How okay. is my, how's my life unfolding? We put that in a third category, I suppose. I think so. And there's the, I don't know to what degree that dovetails with like the morning words. Do you know that, that routine that a lot of writers have? Yeah, where you do uh, 15 minutes. You wake minutes, up and you do, yeah, yeah, and without like thinking at all. And yeah. I think part of the idea there is it sort of gets you out of perfectionism. Like you're just going and yep. letting your, letting your thoughts flow up flow out so there's also this course sort of warming up aspect to yep. it um so yeah i guess that is a different kind i mean yeah so here's my contrarian take gabe because this is what i'm doing today <laughs> um just as important as journaling is boredom now i'm gonna i'm gonna connect this all right this doesn't seem like it makes sense but i'm gonna connect this all uh i talk about this in digital minimalism my book digital minimalism that one of the interesting scourges of our current moment that we're under appreciating is that smartphones with ubiquitous high-speed wireless internet has created this incredibly novel environment in the history of the human species in which you can banish every single moment of being alone with your own thoughts. Because no matter where you are, there's this thing that can algorithmically select highly salient distraction. That's a very new thing that everywhere you are, you have this, which means we get no time if we don't want it. We can get no time alone with our own thoughts. And I, I, I go through this research in the book about why time alone with your own thoughts is incredibly important. It's how you make sense of yourself. It's how you make sense of the things you've encountered or experienced and you integrate them into your self uh, perception. It's where you confront the things you're not happy about and emphasize the things you are. It's how you evolve as a human being. It's, it's the cognitive structure of your awareness of the world. So it's really a problem if you're not working on this structure. To work on the structure, you have to spend time alone with your own thoughts. So, so I, my contrarian take is, um, if you want the benefits of self-reflective journalism, journaling, like one of the simplest things you could do has nothing to do with a physical journal. It would be just making sure that on regular points of time, you don't have your phone with you. And so you're in line and you're forced to be alone with your own thoughts. You do that on a regular basis. Human instinct is wired to basically self-reflect and try to make sense of the world. So it's almost like getting rid of the thing that prevents self-reflection could be just as important as having the right tool to actually uh, direct your self-reflection. I call it, my catchy name was solitude deprivation. Solitude deprivation, I like that. And, and I think that has an important sort of conceptual premise, which is that we often think about what things we can add to be better at yeah. stuff. But I think in many cases, 
the quicker way to get better at certain things is to take something away that's just in the way, like yeah. obstacle removal instead of like building block addition. Yeah, it takes more time to get a journal and to try to put aside the time when I'm going to do the words. Well, really, it's like don't take your phone when you walk your dog. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to do anything new, but that could, that could lead to a, a much better place. My story in the book about this, I got really into Lincoln and the uh, rest home that, that's here in the... Uh, I guess it's near like Petworth or Shaw here mm -hmm. in the in DC, where he would leave the White House to go to to just walk and think and and uh, how he grappled with ideas up there. He just needed time alone with his own thoughts to make sense of the what was going on with the Civil War and, and his role and his uh, his moral development. Yeah, uh, time alone with his own thoughts. Yeah. So yeah. if if he had had a phone, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, we America probably wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, or they would think he's a wizard. Right. Electricity <laughs> hadn't been invented. Right. <laughs> so he'd be the ruler of the world. He would have been an amazing like Twitter troll if you think about it though. He was like He's know, really real funny. For Gab, yeah. yeah, he was really funny. Yeah. Yeah. He might have been a, a different character. All right, let's keep rolling here. Um next question, anonymous, no name. I find myself very forgetful. What system could I set up to help me remember things when I need it? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, probably the best thing to do here, and, and Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, like in Chris Nolan's movie Memento, mm -hmm. tattoos. Tattoos is tattoos are good. Yeah, then you can just reference yeah. uh, if there's like an amnesia, uh, amnesia situation. Yeah. like you know, it's not it's not going anywhere. Tattoos are good. You got a lot of if you don't have a lot already, then you've got a lot of space to work with. You got a lot of space um, to work with. Yeah, and you just sort of like get, get the things on yeah. there and remind yourself. About, Recommend getting them while on cocaine. Uh, yeah, sponsored by cocaine. Mm -hmm. Run right. them through Grammarly before you get them inked though they're gonna let you get like a really cool really cool grammatically correct exactly phrase yeah no i appreciate that i don't know systems that can help me remember things when i need it i mean if you're using the type of systems we talked about earlier in the show i mean you have some sort of full capture on your obligations and you're doing some sort of multi-scale planning so you, you look at this you know you're like okay i have my big ideas my big initiatives or my quarterly plan and when i do my weekly plan i'm looking at my obligation list and and my strategic uh my larger quarterly plan and that all i look at that weekly plan then when i make my daily plan and i look at my daily plan when i'm trying to figure out what i should be doing and i have my calendar to backstop me on things that are tied to a particular time i mean you remember things and when it comes to big ideas you have the type of systems that that uh, dave talked about your sort of spark list i mean I think if you are org if you've organized what's going on in your life, you don't need a specific system different than all those things we talked about for trying not to forget things um, that might be important. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I also think it depends what are you trying like if you're forgetting your car keys a lot or something, then having a hook where you put them every time makes yeah. a big difference. Same yeah, place every enough. time, right? Yeah. If there's something that you need to encounter every day, like put it in your path. So when you walk past it, you see it. I think, so I think it depends what we're talking about remembering. In terms of information I consume, I really try hard to work it into my semantic network, you know, the spider web of connected ideas in my yeah. brains. So when I read something I think it's important, I stop and think about how does this connect to all this other stuff I know, because that turns out to make it like much easier to- If there's to an back. idea you want to hold on to. Totally. Yeah. I was, I remember I was interviewing this neuroscientist named Ogi Ogus, who, who had done some research on memory and he um, was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And sure. because he had studied semantic network and memory, he knew that like if you picture a spider web, if memories are sort of attached by different threads of the web, if you can bring up one yeah. that's related, it'll shake the web and you it might bring up the others that are connected. So he said, when you go on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, what they don't show you is that you can like talk to the host as long as you want before you have to guess and they just right. edit that out. So he would just keep talking, 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 talking in the hope that the conversation would trigger would some semantic trigger association. He would remember yeah. it. And he he won the half million dollars. Then he got the million dollar question correct, but had already decided to walk with the half million. But his whole strategy was to talk about as much different crap as he could. And it would come up. That it would trigger his own semantic network. So wow, when you learn new information, try to connect it to stuff you already know to build that, that spider web in your head. I like it. It's better than my millionaire strategy, which is just the hope that every question is related to a traumatic event from my past. As in Slum Dog Millionaire. Like, <laughs> like I watched the movie, like, this is it. I'm just going to hope that, like, everything is going to be related to, like, yeah, something to happen to so, me. In my, yeah. yeah, didn't go well. Didn't go well. <laughs> uh, all right, I got a couple of questions here that are uh, more case study type questions. So these are people giving a detailed scenario about their lives and then oh, has yeah. a question about it. First one comes from Sam. Sam says, I'm a solicitor, lawyer, practicing in the UK. My practice is very busy, and I oftentimes struggle 
struggled with time management. In the last three months, I've adopted time blocking and I purchased your second edition time block planner. I'm finding that I'm achieving the results you promise, but my job requires me to be reactionary. My question is, do you think there is any merit in time blocking the first half of the day, ending with a time block for planning the second half of the day, at which point it may be clear as to what the demands of the rest of the day are? It was a technical question. I love technical time block questions. Um, I mean, Sam, my first instinct is yes, because of the principle when it comes to planning at any scale. The point of planning is to help to make sure that your energy uh, has some intentional direction. Planning, however, is not a game show where you get a higher and higher prize the closer you're able to happen to stick to the plan you made in advance. We talk about this, it's very clear with daily time block planning where people get in the mindset of, um, my goal here is to figure out a plan that I hit exactly. And if I don't, I've lost. And I get really upset if my plan has to change. Where the reality is, depending on the nature of your job, there's probably uh, quite a bit of changes that will happen in your plan. So what you're doing in the morning is like your best bet. Okay, knowing what I know now, what's my plan for directing my energy? And then when your day changes in ways you didn't anticipate, you update the plan next time you get a chance. Then say, knowing what I know now, what's the best way to do with my time that's left? So it's the intentionality. At any one point, I want to have some intention on what I do with my time going forward. That's the win, not, hey, I was able to hit my plan, you know, exactly without having to change it. So I think this is a great plan. You know, plan the morning, step back, make a plan for the next part of the day based on what you know then. The goal is like you want to attack each thing that's coming up with some intention to it, not that you want to try to actually, uh, not you actually want to try to win the day. I mean, I wish I had a job that never changed my plan. Yeah, right. I mean, this sounds like a great experiment. I'd yeah. say run this experiment exactly as it was articulated for yep. a week. and Keep track of it in your self-regulatory notebook. Yeah. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then adjust something. Maybe yeah, it should be back. half a day. Or maybe yeah. the other thing, Sam, I've heard people do is they have protected block time. Hey, these three hours, it's all very intentionally used. Um, and the rest of the day, if you have an incredibly reaction job, reactive job, it's probably a better term than reactionary. You have a very reactive job then you're like, okay, then I'm just rock and rolling with what's come, what comes in. All right, let's, uh, we got one more here. This is from agent three zero. Oh, I see where that, I see the three zero reference here in the very first line of your question here. I recently turned 30 and like many people, I experienced some stress associated with that milestone. Um, Dave and I haven't turned 30 yet, not but, yet, but I assume, yet, but you know, that'll be stressful. Looming. I'm yeah. worried. I mean, clearly we're not there yet, but like it will be stressful. I'm very concerned. I graduated with a master's of arts degree about five years ago, but despite some good interviews, I wasn't able to land a job in my field after school and have spent the last five years consistently underemployed. I'm also passionate about art and creative writing, but my attempts at these have only resulted in a small amount of local success. I'm worried that I'm running out of time to experience professional success as well as being able to start a family with my partner. Since discovering the ideas associated with the deep life, I've been trying to pursue my goal in a more disciplined way, focusing on methodical progress and skill building. However, I feel like my mind doesn't fully trust the approach based on slow productivity because in the back of my mind, I feel like it's going to come too little too late and I should have adopted these strategies five to 10 years ago. I still have high ambitions for my professional and creative life, but deep down, I worry that I'm still not good enough at what I do to realize my ambitions and that I'll be in the same place where I am now in five to 10 years. All right, big question here. Um, I'm going to throw this to you, Dave, in the following way, because you're a professional writer. This sort of is in the same realm. You know, this is someone who's talking about uh, being passionate about art and creative writing and, and having only a small amount of local success. Mm -hmm. um, so writing is in that world. Your whole career has been professional writing, basically post-grad school, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you know what it's like to build a life around one of these, I guess we could call it idealized occupations. It's a idealized, right, very right. specific. I mean, my, my first stable job in writing was as an overnight crime reporter in New York tabloid. So perhaps not ideal, but yeah. your point is But is the, pro taken. the profession the is idealized, yes. right? Like, oh, I mean, it's romantic. Let's say it's a romantic, yeah, yeah. it's a romantic, pro a romantic profession. No, totally. Um, so what do you tell to someone who's like, yeah, I think I want to be an artist or a creative writer. And they feel like they're doing a little bit of stuff and things aren't really clicking. And like, yeah. it's a fair question. I don't feel like yeah. things are going to change. So how do you, what's the right way to approach from your experience, uh, the pursuit of a romantic profession? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of stuff in that question, by the way, personal, professional, yes. like lots of things. And also the, I feel like I should have started right for that. It's like, 
the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. So yep. don't don't worry that you didn't start at the right time Yeah, and, and let that get in the way of starting things that you should be doing now. 30 seems very young to us is what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. totally. I mean, I, I like, yeah. So just, just to share with this person, I like to share this research that MIT and Northwestern, the Census Bureau did a few years ago that showed that the average age of a founder of fast growing tech startup on the day of fast growing was top 0.01%. On the day of founding was 45, right? And people don't, like they just think of Mark Zuckerberg when he said yeah. young people are smarter. He was 22 when he said that, right? You don't yeah. hear him saying that anymore. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I don't think people's intuition is always right about the timescale at which uh, development and success occurs. But I think when you're going into these kinds of fields, the good thing about them are you get like a lot of signal quickly about how difficult it is and yep. how competitive it is. Um, but that's also the challenge, right? And I think it's, um, I think it, it, behooves people to sort of try to work on one piece at a time instead of like trying to get their arms around the whole right. thing, right? Like mo most people that want to go into writing view writing as a form of self-expression, which is why it's like so romantic. I, yeah. I kind of don't. I view it as a very compelling thing to do, yeah. but not self-expression. An interesting job. An interesting but job. But not about I, I want to make my, my artistic self whole or Correct. something such. Yeah. Correct. And so if that's your take on it, I think you look at, well, how does this thing work as a job? What are like yes. the skills and tools that I need? So especially early in my career, but at, I mean, early in my career, but again, I was five, six, I, when I left the track where I was training to be an environmental scientist and I was at Sports Illustrated as a temp fact checker, like five, I was five years older than the people I was doing like remedial kind of work for, yeah. you know, but looking at what are, what's the toolbox that I need yeah. and instead of just like trying to do another project and assuming I would get different results, it was like, what skill set do I need and how do I get around those people so that I can start getting it? So you, you, you had kind of done some research on this. Yeah. You I mean, said, okay, a fact checking, you know, uh, at Sports Illustrated, like this is an actual known path. Uh, this is, this is what it would look like to be taking the next step. Like within a couple of years, I should be able to get here and here's what I should be working on to get here. And, and being around the people. Right? What was, what was the step after fact checking? Uh, well, so I had, I had gotten... I mean, there were some other winding steps. Like, again, I, my first job in journalism was overnight crime report at the New York Daily News, right? Yeah. Like, nothing happy that's going in New York Daily News it happens to be midnight and 10 a.m., as yeah. you can imagine. But that gave me this great ability to do street reporting, right? No phone, no computer. You're going and finding people in the street. Yeah. Then I went to a startup where there was covering higher education that was no street reporting, all phone and email. Yeah. So now I'm getting that skill, yeah. right? Then I leave that just to get my foot in the door at Sports Illustrated. Now I'm around people who do long form writing who are way better than me. So yeah. I'm Every day I'm around people who are way, way better than me. So now I'm getting this these skills of even though I'm not doing the writing, yeah. I'm having to go through their writing in fine detail and sort of understanding how that works. How did you figure out that's the way in? Uh, I had I had wanted to get into Sports Illustrated. I had this specific interest in writing about sudden cardiac death in athletes, basically. Yeah. And whenever I did something good, I would I would send it over to them, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, and say like, hey, just, you know, and keep in touch. And it took me like two years of doing that before yeah. they said, somebody's going on maternity leave. We have a temp opening for a fact checker. Would you like to leave yeah. your real job and come do this? So you were saying, great, I'm just looking for a way to get in that door. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I was looking for a way to get around the people that were doing the kind of things that I wanted to learn how to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's then and then once I got that skill set and I felt like my learning curve was tapering off, I left to become an, in when I, I had like a office and the 32nd floor of a building above 6th Avenue, big window door and everything at Sports Illustrated when I became a senior writer. And then I left to be an intern at then Startup ProPublica doing investigative stuff because I said, how do I learn how, how do yeah. I get around people who know how to do this thing that I don't know how to do? So I just looked at it as what are, instead of this whole big insurmountable, how do I just get to that place? Yeah. What are like the tools I need to put in the toolbox and how do I start going about that? What was the jump from fact checking to writing? Within sports, I mean, I guess I'm assuming once you're once you're there and you know people and you're fact checking, you've been yeah. sending them stuff for years. It's a much uh, smaller leap to say, "Hey, can can I pitch this or pitch that?" I mean, you're and, in the building, but I got when I started pitching stuff, I was getting shot down. I mean, I was like, you know, just a temp, but yeah, then but they would hear it, they would hear it, and it turned out I had this oddball background, right? I came in with this science background, yeah. I had a crime reporting background, yeah. and so all of a sudden I realized that those were huge assets because yeah. I was different than the other people I was around. Yeah. So whereas I was like shaping up to be, I would say like a pretty normal scientist, you yeah. take those like typical science skills and you put them in a sports magazine. Yeah. It's like, so now you're like a Nobel laureate, yeah. right? Okay. So you had to figure out also, yeah. how can I fit in what I can do to what they're looking for? Yeah. And that's where they were like, oh, okay. Yeah. You can yeah. try this art. What was the first article that they accepted from you to go write? 
uh, the first article I ever wrote was, um, and really I was just sent out to, re to report on it, give that reporting to someone else for the magazine, but yeah. I then wrote my own version on the website. And it was where the backup kicker at the University of Northern Colorado had stabbed the starter in his kicking leg to try to take his job, being driven crazy by his like football obsessed mom. Yeah. And they're like, don't you have some crime reporting experience? Get out there. And so I'm like, it was very New York scene. I give like a cabbie a hundred bucks, like take me to the airport, you take know, right airport, away. So, yeah. And, and so I was just supposed to give that reporting to one of the more senior writers so he could write his like essay on it. Yes. But then I did like sort of the more normal version online and they were like, huh, like, I guess if crime stuff comes up, like you're pretty useful, huh? Yeah. Because you've been doing it. So they're like, oh, we'll just post to like the facts thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the reason why they, they were saying, uh, we, we need that research for our senior writer to do a long form piece. But as long as you're doing that, let's yeah. get a, just an article well, online. Well, that's what I said. I yeah. said, let me do because he because he was he was like an essay writer. Yeah. So he did this essay version, right. and I did like the feature story online. Yeah. Right. And then I would look for other things where there were whole. So I had fact checking. So I had a I had a job, like a day job. Yeah. Uh, so I could pay rent or whatever. But then I would use any of my extra time to look for things that I could pitch or that other things that people weren't weren't yeah. covering. And I, th I think that can be really helpful, like getting something that's kind of in the industry but is not nearly your dream job but it it gives you the flexibility to sort of broadens your network yep. right and and so you can start to look for opportunities and not like be hinging everything on like one project where i'm like did i get the dream or did i not like step 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 forward yeah right right so it's not just you sending like massive long form pieces of sports illustrator like oh i that. did try that I yeah did try but it doesn't that. work didn't right? work yeah <laughs> at some point of, like this is great i mean it, it's it's like you know the new yorker gets a lot of this of like yeah. john mcphee the bees yeah like they're like we have a john mcphee i told i totally tried that yeah yeah just didn't yeah just didn't work <laughs> yeah yeah uh, that's interesting okay so so if i'm going to summarize this as it's like a, it's an evidence-based concrete plan yeah okay it's evidence-based like I'm, I'm i'm learning about this industry and i want a concrete let's say evidence-based concrete feasible plan like this yeah. is pragmatic that i could um maybe get a foot in the door job and then, you know, I'm going to find my, it should take me a year or two, but I'm going to find my advantage. And here's how I'm going to try to like get my first things published. And it's, so it's, it's very pragmatic. It's very evidence-based. There's a flip to this though, too, right? Which is, um, when the evidence-based concrete plan doesn't work, yeah. then it's probably easier to ripcord and it might not be ripcording on the entire dream, but it might be, okay, this is not working. Yeah. I'm not getting the fact checking job or I have the fact checking job and I'm just I'm not finding an angle to actually get something yeah. published the clarity of the plan maybe gives you the clarity of this is not working yeah I totally I mean again this is this has been like a theme I think in our conversation today which is yeah. if you have a something a plan whatever yeah. it is the plan doesn't have to be right yeah the experiment doesn't have to be right yep but it gives you something to evaluate your learning and your model of the world against yeah and to learn, to get the max amount of learning signal you can to yeah. make your next move. And it could become clear, like this vision I had or this plan I had for breaking the magazine writing didn't work. Right. Like I did, I tried sending in the, like, yeah. I did this masterpiece, thousands of words yeah, thing. That was I'm the sending first in plan. and I'm like, yeah. uh, uh, well, okay, that didn't. And in retrospect, I'm like, well, obviously that plan wasn't going to work, but I had to learn that by trying it. Yeah. Know? So then you get a more detailed plan and yeah, so, yeah. so that's good. So the, the flip side then is it also teaches you like, okay, this is not working. So maybe I need to try something different. Um, it may also teach you that that field is just not the dream that you thought it was in a lot of ways. I think that's oftentimes yep. what a lot of people learn, that it's not what they thought. And maybe there's some aspect of it they like. And the dream can be transposed to some other milieu that's like sort of more amenable to the life they want to lead. Yeah. And you end up, you know, doing a podcast instead or something and it's a better fit for what you're doing or, or something like that. I mean, don't do a podcast because that's kind of depressing, but you know what I mean as yeah. an example. Um, I'm going to throw one other thing in there as well. I love this advice. The other thing I'm going to throw in is, uh, so you can be, be a, aggressive about your vision and concrete about your action. So what I mean by this is that the phrase we use all the time on the show, lifestyle centric career planning. So agent three zero, you don't want everything to collapse onto just, you know, your work. Like this is what defines my life. And am I happy or not? Is like, I just have this vision that if I have this job in creative writing or whatever, uh, I'm successful. And if I don't, I don't. And this is everything you want to have this clear vision of your lifestyle. What do I want my life to be like in five years? Not just professionally, but in all aspects, like where do I live? Who am I around? What's the rhythm of my day? Uh, what's my relationship to my community and to other, the world of ideas. You, you build this really concrete, uh, really aspirational vision, and then you can work backwards and say, okay, now let's get super practical and concrete. What are the things I can do starting with where I am now to make uh, the biggest possible steps towards this vision? And it's not all going to be professional things. And it's going to give you different possible configurations of steps that get you closer to that vision. And so maybe the vision in which you're Norman Mailer, uh, 
that's not really coming together, but there's other aspects of your ideal lifestyle you can get to with a, a different type of job coupled with this over here. And it gives you, uh, it allows you to put your uh, aspiration to work, but to transmute it into very concrete type steps so that you don't just get fixated on one particular thing. It's not always just jobs either, like the, especially like during the pandemic. I think a lot of people put a lot of um, energy onto location shifts as the savior, mm, mm. you know, like, okay, everything, all the things I'm unhappy about, all of it will be solved Yeah, when I like buy this farm. I mean, you know, that, that, whatever. that's like, a whole, right, with work, with location, whatever it is, I think the thing that people often mistake is that wherever you go, whatever success you have, you're still there. You're right? there. You're, yep. you're, you're still you. You still and have so, to pay taxes. Right. Your car still breaks down. <laughs> and you, and so you still have to work on sort of your stuff or the idea of, yeah, with regard to the arts, like, that dream of that it's like the only thing you'll ever be doing. I mean, that that wasn't really true for most breakthrough artists in any era until like after they did the things that yeah. made them successful, right? It's like they were cobbling together yeah. uh, the space to, to do these kinds of things. Yeah, and, and a lot of people were cobbling together stuff and nothing particularly interesting came out of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I like it. I think we're making progress. I will say I do think it's it. one thing I worry about for, for people that want to get into these kinds of fields is I learned so much from being physically around people like being in the office at sports illustrated it was almost like i was getting coached without knowing it every hour of the day sure and i do worry as people are sort of more remote you're gonna lose that like thinking about if i had it had to attempt to recreate that amount of learning yep. on my own remotely yep. i just don't know how i would do it it's it hard like a lot yeah longer. and you could try to use youtube to recreate it but youtube is so driven by algorithms yeah that the the content is more often about like what makes for a good video well this was a big element in the writer strike like mm -hmm. one of the arguments they were making is that the the structure of streamers is set up such that you no longer have these long seasons where writers are just around mm -hmm. and they said how is anyone that's one of the big the big arguments is how is anyone going to learn to be a showrunner yeah the way this used to happen is writers are just it's a long season and they're on set and they're seeing how things happen and they go to set to help punch things up and they learn and with the smaller season format for the streamers one of the things they were worried about you bring in contract writers they like write for a few days and like they, they go away how is anyone going to learn how the television industry works. Yeah. And I so mean, it's a similar sort of thing. I think this is like a huge challenge. It's a big thing in academia. I've written about this before. It's it, why do um, star young professors typically come from programs where they studied with star senior professors? Uh, the obvious answer is like, well, because it's the they're the smarter professors or they're harder to get into. But most of these like really good grad students could, you know, there's a lot of really good grad students, right? That could get into these programs. Um, I often said being around star professors exposes you to how star professors operate. And so outside of the intellectual content of just, oh, they have really smart ideas. It's like, what's it like if you run a biology lab that wants to be on the cover of nature? Right. There's a right. lot of really specific things that goes into like how you run that lab, right. how you think about your problems, how you like evaluate and report. And it looks very different than if you're uh, at a non R1 university and it's just, look, I need to have this minimal level of NIH funding to sort of get tenure or something. You're going to learn something very different. Totally there. different and, culture. And yeah. you could be yeah. brilliant coming out of the other place, but you haven't been exposed to this entire culture of like, what does it look like if I'm trying to run a, and I saw that at MIT all the time. It's like, the, it was very good at teaching people how to be stars. Mm, that, not that like their brain is not just about the, especially in a lot of the physical sciences, like there's intuition and smartness, but everyone's really smart. It's not, they're just solving Fermat's last theorem in their head. <laughs> it's like they have an approach to work uh, and how do you actually, how do you make good of that ambition? Like what does even that work look like? You know, how is it different if you really want it to be at the caliber that's going to be on the cover of nature? You're, it's different the way you like approach that work and, and, and run your lab and triage your ideas. And there's like three more levels of sharpening it that you might not have seen at another school. That, that, that really jibes too, I think, with what you're saying with research done. I think it's by Brian Uzi at Northwestern, some of his colleagues about mentoring, where yeah. basically their conclusion was that most of the value of mentoring was implicit knowledge. Like not the things that the mentor is telling the mentee, oh, but the mentee being able to just like observe. So being around the mentor, the mentor yeah. actually doing what they yeah. do. So again, yeah. which I think is a little concerning for like the remote. Uh, yeah. I, I, I heard one of my editors, the New Yorker was telling me stories about how the cool old building before they moved, I guess they moved from downtown to midtown or midtown to downtown or whatever, wherever happened. Um, but it was a scene and there's good and bad of it, but the scene sound very interesting. Mm. The, the writers would just hang around. Um, even if you're just like someone like me, who's like, I, I write on a regular basis, but you know, 
have other things going on you would yeah. just hang around yeah. like yeah i'm just yeah. going to be there like see what's going on and there was researchers and you could just like grab a researcher and be like hey can you like go to the archive and bring clips and, and people would just be like yelling at each other in the hallways and stuff like that and there, you know there's probably something to that I met uh, Jimmy Breslin, the famous columnist, when I was in my early when I was a tabloid reporter, and he was like way late into his career. And he, he, I remember I, I must have asked him for some advice or something about that writing. Yeah. And he said, Well, you know, reporters are in a lot better shape right now because they go to the gym instead of the bar after work, but they're a lot worse at writing. <laughs> I was like, Okay. I believe it. I believe it. We should do more cocaine. All yeah. right. <laughs> Solution to everything. We got a final segment coming Brought on. Brought to you by cocaine. Brought to you by cocaine. Speaking of sponsors, before we get to our final segment, I want to mention another sponsor that makes this show possible. Uh, that is our friends at Policy Genius. So speaking about, you know, figuring out your vision for life, part of that vision should be if you're people who rely on you having enough life insurance so that they will be protected if the uh, the unthinkable happens. Why then don't more people have life insurance? Don't they put that on their obligation status list and it gets worked into their quarterly down, into their weekly down, into their daily plan? Why does it still not happen? It's because a lot of people don't know how to get started. Where do you go? Who do you talk to? Do you have to like do a feats of strength? or How does that even work? This is where Policy Genius enters the scene. It helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts are on hand to help you get through it. They know how valuable your time is, so their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and can even help you avoid unnecessary medical exams. So the whole point here is if this is on your obligation status list, I need more life insurance. Now you have a simple way of taking care of that. Policy Genius makes it easy. So your family deserves peace of mind. A life insurance policy through Policy Genius can give it to them. Head to policygenius.com slash deep questions or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and to see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash deep questions. I also want to talk about my friend at My Body Tutor. This was started by Adam Gilbert, who I've known for a long time. He used to be the fitness guru on the very earliest versions of my Study Hacks blog. His company, My Body Tutor, is really killing it out there because it's a brilliant idea. It is a 100% online coaching program that solves the biggest problem in health and fitness, which is lack of consistency. So when you sign up with them, you are assigned a coach that works with you to develop your plan around nutrition and around fitness that's going to fit exactly what your goals are, what your constraints are, and then you check in with this coach every day. And they make it real easy. They have an app where you can just very quickly, hey, here's how it went, here's what I ate or what have you. And you get feedback every day, hey, going great. Um, you can ask quick questions like, you know, I'm really having a hard time with this whatever that, that we planned and the coach can get back to you. So you have someone that's not only keeping you accountable, but helping you react to the unexpected in your life and adapt your fitness and nutrition plan to fit exactly what you're looking for and exactly what your needs are. And because it's online, you don't have to have this person come to your house. You can get that type of accountability and help at a fraction of the price that it would cost to have, you know, a nutritionist and fitness trainer that, that comes to your house every day. So if you're serious about getting fit, Adam is giving deep questions listeners $50 off their first month. All you have to do is mention this podcast when you join. Just go to mybodytutor.com, mention deep questions, and they will give you $50 off your first month. All right, so we made it to our third and final segment. This is where I like to react to something that's been going on uh, in the news recently. So Dave, here's an interesting one. It's a talk that Ted just released. I guess Ted drips these out okay. after the conference. Um, and some people have been talking to me about it because I think it's an, an interesting concept. I'll show a little bit of the video here on the screen uh, for those who are watching. So who you're seeing on the screen here, this is uh, Louis Von Ahn, A-H-N, uh, from Guatemala who is talking about, I believe he's the founder of Duolingo, which is software that helps you learn foreign languages. I don't know if you've used it before. A little bit. A little bit. And, and so the point of this talk, here's his title, How to Make Learning as Addictive as Social Media. 
All right. So what's going on here is he's saying, look, I designed Duolingo in a way to use some of these same mechanisms that attention economy platforms use to try to keep you using their apps all the time. We should use these same ideas when it comes to productive learning, like learning a new language. People will use it more and you will uh, net increase the amount of learning that there exists in the world. So it's an interesting idea that is sparking debate both uh, in favor of this and both people who have some concerns about it. So I thought it would be worth talking a little bit here on the show. Um, so I'll give you my thought and then Dave, you can give me your reaction okay. to, to how, you, how you're thinking about it. To me, I think we're talking about two different motivational centers. And I don't necessarily mean literally in terms of these are distinct in the brain, but just from a cognitive science abstraction point of view, there's two different motivational centers that are relevant here. So there's a motivational center that's going to offer you in the moment. It responds to, I'm going to be offered in the moment, some sort of uh, immediately gratifying stimulus. So that's the motivational center. That's like, I'm going to grab these potato chips or I'm going to just uh, load up Twitter because immediately it's going to show me people yelling about things that I kind of care about. And I'm going to feel good or righteous or upset. And you know, I'm just going to get that treat right away. There's another type of motivational center though. And this is the motivational center I was thinking about when I was recently watching the new Netflix documentary on the football player. I'm using the British terms, David Beckham. And in the first seer episode of the series, they were talking about how David Beckham became such a good uh, football player. And it was this obsessive practicing just all the time. All he was doing was practicing. He had grown up in a household where his, his dad was obsessed with Manchester United, obsessed with the, the English National World Cup team. They would get the new kit each year for Christmas to wear. And, and, and he kind of internalized this, recognized also he had some sort of gifts and just would sort of practice obsessively. That's a different motivational center. Because in the moment when you're in the back garden of your house in Manchester, just uh, repetitively trying to bounce the ball on your foot or whatever you're doing, that doesn't have that immediate gratifying stimuli that looking at, let's say, Twitter does. It's a different type of motivational center that's built on some sort of longer term motivation towards a goal that has a long term meaning. So it's a deeper satisfaction style of goal. So one point I would put out here is that when it comes to learning, the sustainable approach here might be to figure out how do we connect out to that latter type of motivational center? That how do we, we inculcate an idea that uh, being exposed to ideas, to learning things, to building up a more complicated view of the world is a motivating part of a picture of a deeper life, a life that's going to be uh, more rich and interesting, a life that is from a teleological perspective, taking more advantage of what it is that the hum humankind is available of. This is Aristotle and the Nicomachean ethics talking about deep thought as the most human of human activities. How do we ta ta uh, tap into this more sort of philosophical motivation, this more sustainable motivation and it may have very little to do with the shininess or the in the moment impulsivity of the actual tools there have been people who have been uh, deeply drawn to learning throughout all of sort of written human history and for the most of that time period they didn't have shiny apps i'm being a little curmudgeonly about this dave but you know a lot about the brain you know a lot about these motivational centers where do you come down on this well i haven't watched this particular ted talk but um, I think if the idea of it is that a language learning app is going to become as or more entertaining than Instagram yeah. or TikTok, yeah. I think that is a non-starter. You're going to have to spend two to three billion dollars a year. I just I, trying I just, to compete with them. I just don't see unless you're layering the language learning on top of the TikToks yeah. that people are making for maximum entertainment or maximum enragement or whatever it is. I just that just doesn't seem possible to me. Can I make a suggestion though? Sure. Cocaine drip. Uh, that's yeah. Okay. I didn't want to like, you know, go so heavy handed. On every our time sponsor, you get a, but yes. every time you get a verb, correct. I, but being facetious, but that probably is what would be required to make a language learning app well, as desirable as TikTok. Yeah, because that's basically yeah. what's happening, right? It's yeah. like activating that same part of your brain that, yeah. that makes you addicted. Um, and so I think that's kind of a non-starter. Yeah. So I think never mind that like, yes, you can make a language learning app more interesting than the most interesting way to make language learning interesting is like to drop somebody in Paris or what or wherever yeah, or it to is. make it effective. I mean, yeah, maybe it's not right. interesting. It could be oh, terrifying. I think it's very interesting, but, but it works. Yeah. 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 But I think, I think this larger structural issue you're talking about, I think about it in two ways. So let's say to use the, the Beckham analogy or into sports, right? I was an 800 meter runner in college, which yeah. 
is useful because people normally think of it as like the most miserable uh, event that you can possibly run because there's lots of puking and stuff like that. Yeah, I agree. And and that's true. And training uh, was even more miserable in that way than than racing. Yeah, because you do repeats. So why do you like? Why would you do this stuff? Why would you do this stuff? Because it is incom incredibly compelling when you have this goal of getting like a little bit better at this thing, and it's so compelling. It's not because you would never do that stuff otherwise. You you like cannot even bring yourself to do that stuff yeah. unless you have this larger strategic goal in mind, which makes that an incredibly interesting thing to be doing. Yeah, you know, and I think. I think when I think about that in sort of the larger world of learning things, like when I think about if I'm like looking at Instagram or something like that, uh, and then I switch to say reading something that's difficult to read. Like I spent a bunch of time last year reading James Joyce's Ulysses, yeah. very difficult. And because I was coming from things that were so much simpler at first, I'm like, what the heck is this? Cra You're not even in like the mental mode of reading slowly enough to be able to grapple with it. Yeah. But once I was able to transition into that mode, yeah. it's like one of those reading experiences that changes your mind and changes your life. So you were swiping the pages at first. Yeah, right. Like where are the more right. interesting pages? Exactly. Yeah. And then you exactly. sort of evolved over time. And, and, yeah. and then the point you realize is not to get through this thing as quickly as possible. Yeah. Right. Because it took me like, I had to start over once I got maybe 200 pages in because only then did I realize that there were two different omniscient narrators operating at the same time. One who was like the creative one and one was sort of the normal one. Yep. And there was no signal that they were switching until you picked up on their voices, basically. So you had to pay attention. And so then yeah. you got to go back and say, yeah. oh, this is something I've never seen before. Yeah. But until until you get into that space of I want to grapple with this and I want it to change me and I want it to connect to these other things that I know. Yeah. Because I had gotten interested in experimental literature and modernism and stuff outside of that if somebody was like here's james joyce's ulysses like it's important go learn it no i needed like this wider framework so you were, you were driven by i i have an an interest and an aspiration to to be better versed in experimental modern in artistic innovation really yeah. i was interested i'm interested in innovation generally yeah and you know this like, was an important work of sort of early modernism and particularly in 1922 in particular there was this flood yeah. at the same time of things that like completely changed art forever and i was like what the heck was going on in so you being able to have read and understood that book it's sort of also like you being able to be hey selected on the the track team like you're going to be in our first position like all that training was worth it because like imagine me actually being like one of the top runners yeah uh, there's a goal there's a longer term goal and, and there were there was i mean being curious about innovation i was curious about what was going on in that year right so yeah. first i was curious just about innovation in general then i'm curious about artistic innovation then i zoom in on this particular period and what the heck is going on there yeah and so there's all these layers of why do i want to understand this why is it worth it for me to grapple with this yeah because it's informing all these other interests yeah I've developed well you know? well two points on that one uh that that approach that joyce used of having a, a difference between omniscient and non-omniscient narrator that that switched in a sort of non-signaled way exact same mechanism I used in how to become a straight A student. <laughs> I don't think most readers picked up on yeah. it, but but I was really influenced by Joyce when I was trying to trying to formulate the, the whatever. Second, yeah. and perhaps more serious, is this is one of the things that's lost. I got put I, I keep putting my curmudgeon hat on, but it's one of the things that's lost when uh, you take a 12 year old and say, we're now giving you the the digital cocaine. Mm -hmm. We're just giving you the the thing that can uh, cir circumvent any of this sense of like boredom or drive right. can immediately solve that. Here's yeah. your phone and, yeah. and you've got, you know, Roblox on there and social media and YouTube and all this type of stuff. You are um, perhaps stunting the ability to, I'm going to develop these type of um, deeper aspirations that power up that second motivational system yeah. and get me doing things. It was, you know, obsessively playing my guitar and trying to learn the whole catalog of this particular type of music, getting um, really into, you know, whatever type of uh, novels. And then I want to go through like a whole um, phase of this writer or that and like developing that part of your identity or whatever it is, right? Because you're uh, short circuiting the, you're short circuiting, yeah. you need some motivation, right? We don't like doing nothing. Yeah. But if you can always short circuit it, yeah. then maybe you never get that experience of like, well, I'm bored. Yeah. And so I really want the, the, you know, like for Beckham, all that work was worth it for when at the age of 13, the owner of Man United called and said, hey, we want you on our dev team, yeah. right? Like that, but you're not gonna, you don't necessarily need that. If you're like, no, I'm making progress in my um whatever online video game yeah. plan is like, is, is doing better. I mean, our distraction, oh, this is so, I hate this. I sound like such a, 
we didn't have rock and roll music when I was a kid <laughs> type of thing. I was just, but I was going to say like our distractions as kids were not very good. Yeah, there was like well, two good television shows. I mean, and Nintendo came along and stuff like that. But Nintendo that, you know, wasn't is... good. Like I had a Nintendo <laughs> and we had all the games. My mom didn't worry about screen time because like they weren't very interesting. I, I, I don't know. I think it was good, but I don't think it was like engineered to like keep you hooked on I it. I could play for about an hour and it would be boring. I don't know. Like how much can you duck hunt? But even, even that feels to me like more legitimate problem solving than a lot of the stuff that's going on in technology today. I agree. Well, know? okay, here's my, this is an important rant. This is an important rant. Maybe not duck hunt, but. Arcades. So if you play a game in arcade today, it's so like if I take my kids to Dave and Buster's or something yeah. like this, and like you're playing at the arcade games, they've engineered out like any type of complicated like decision. You can't even move your guy around anymore. It's all like, it'll move you through a space um, you can't move and all you're given like one thing to do. It's like, I can, they'll, they'll pop up these like dinosaurs. I can kind of aim my gun at and shoot. Mm. Like there's no degrees of freedom in it anymore. They've tried to just make it into this like directly engaging experience of just sort of like lights are going on. They've minimized what you actually try to do. There's, there's no friction into it. Or Interesting. like I was in the computers as a kid, there was so much friction being in the computers in like 1991. Like you were, you know, basically taking the cover off and writing code and working with the memory or this or that. And now consumer facing electronics, the whole thing is like, it's just delightful. You just sort of like touch the screen and it pops open and it like shows you what you want to show. And, um, is there like, I don't know, do your kids do like Minecraft or anything? I don't really know anything about Minecraft. You know what I let them do? What? Nintendo. Oh, okay. Cause I have this, uh, this is my theory and I think it's been borne out is like you can games that cost a lot of money are typically games that are designed for a closed gameplay experience. It's, okay. it's a certain number of hours and then you're done, like Zelda or something like this. And they're hard. And so you play for a little while and it's fun and then it's tough and you get kind of bored with it. It's very, if a game is cheap, then their entire business model, if it's free or cost a dollar, the entire business model is we want you to play this as long as possible. Right, right. So like if I give my kid a Nintendo Switch, like they'll play for a while, Zelda or whatever, a World War II simulation aviation game and you get mm -hmm. kind of bored it's kind of mm -hmm. hard but if one of my kids gets their hands we learn this the hard way on an ipad with games they'll just like obsessively just switch from thing to thing it's this weird sort of uh stimulation trance because most of the ipad games are designed around engagement interesting yeah that's really interesting you made me think of to bring like some of this full circle to when we were talking about like my career progression earlier is when i was trying to build my tool set and i was first at this like New York tabloid in journalism, yeah. I never had to come up with ideas because someone was always just killed or something blew up or was lit on fire or whatever. And right. so you're just running out to whatever that thing is. Yeah. And then I go to a job that's totally different from that. And I'm like, oh gosh, I have to like generate ideas. Yes. And that like forced you to do, you know, you have to go just like talk to strangers or figure out how to even I generate ideas out yeah. of nowhere. Right. Yeah. Whereas when I was in the environment where there was like always something happening, yeah. I never had to come up with ideas. You have to think ever. about it. So I did. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, a similar effect could be going on now with people where I never have to actually like think of what I want to do to get yeah. rid of my boredom. Yeah. Like, I mean, the one important thing I want to add to the Beckham point, by the way, too, is yeah. that I think once you have that sort of larger set, other interests or larger interests, the stuff that could otherwise seem very much like drudgery and probably does to people from the outside actually becomes a super compelling thing to do. Yes. Right. Um, it's not like, like when I was doing the like torture of 800 meter training, it wasn't like, Oh, I hate this. I mean, I was, I didn't like like throwing up and stuff, but yeah. I was like, I love this. Like yeah. it sucks, but I love it. Yeah. I'm getting better at it. Yeah. Like I'm pretty good at this. It's just like yeah. so engaging. So yeah. incredibly engaging. Yeah. There's a level of engagement from working towards a highly aspirational deep motivation goal that is really different than the engagement of like the dopamine system going in the short term right, maybe that little right. motivation of like right. ah, i just want to turn this thing on right. or i just want to eat this thing it's, it's a completely different type of engagement so yeah, yeah so maybe the game is figuring that out and so the game with learning is trying to connect the things that you want to learn to a vision of life or a, a, a goal that is you know yeah yeah highly yeah, yeah highly and, and i don't think like i think a little bit of like scrolling here and there is okay yeah, right because you have to like sort of do mindless stuff once in a while but yeah, yeah there's no problem with that but it's but it's um it takes over that shouldn't be the model for everything. yeah 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 okay so good we've been we've been sufficiently curmudgeonly all right dave epstein thank you for uh joining me as my special secret guest on the show today i apologize again for the jesse skeleton interview and apologize to anyone who saw it uh again you'll never get those moments of your life back again <laughs> Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of the show. And until then, as always, stay deep.
So if you enjoyed today's episode about essential productivity tools, I think you'll also enjoy episode 261 about controlling your time. Check it out. Actually, I want to shift towards the more practical world of controlling your time.